Hello and welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we continue our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. This is our next to the last uh, video in this study. And we are uh, here on our outline. As you can see, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about our responsibilities in Christ. We've talked about walking in unity. We've spent two lessons talking about walking in purity. We've already spent one lesson about walking in harmony, and now this is our second lesson on that topic. We'll be looking at chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. We'll finish up our study with our next video, Walk in Victory, and that will conclude our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So let's get our Bibles out, and we will turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. Before we read uh, from Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 9, let me make a few introductory comments. First of all, we have to understand that you cannot educate or legislate the end of antagonism, division, and rebellion. We might want to. We might want to make certain laws to destroy these three things, or we might want to try to educate people so that these three things don't exist, but they are going to exist all the time. So it's up to us as individuals to educate our own selves to avoid being caught up in any of these three sins. Only a regenerated heart from God and a new submission to Christ and one another will end this kind of strife. In this lesson, Paul describes how four groups can have harmony in Christ. And we're talking about harmony in the church, but not just in the church. Harmony in the family and harmony in the workplace as well. Let's get into our reading. We're going to look at verses 1, 2, 3, and uh, we're going to try to find four reasons that children should obey their parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So we're going to suggest four reasons that we should obey our parents. First of all, we understand that these children are in the Lord. These children are Christians. Because these children are of an age to understand Paul's commands, I will tell you it's most likely the children that are reading or listening to Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 being read in its entirety were children that were of an age or what we would call grown. Two reasons that children should honor and respect their parents is righteousness and practicality both demanded. So obedience and honor for parents is the Lord's will. It is, it is uh, in the Lord, as we say. It means to hear under authority here. This obedience should be free from insolence or rebellion. Now, if it's free from insolence or rebellion, that reminds us of a few passages that we want to share. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. The proverb writer continues in chapter 6, 20 through 22, My son, keep your father's commandment, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. When you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. And then the Proverbs writer continues even further in Proverbs 30 and verse 17 and gives us a warning. The eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Well, we also uh, will tell you that parents deserve gratitude from their children. And
again, the child's primary motivation, though, is to do what is right. Obedience to parents is obedience to the Lord. Now, of course, as long as the parents are not issuing commands that contradict God's will. Colossians 3 and verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So obedience is the right thing to do. Secondly, obedience is commanded. And as Paul points out, it's originally from the Ten Commandments. And this, of course, includes our regard for aged parents as well. Now, Matthew 15 and Mark 7 are basically parallel passages, so we won't read both of them, but we will read one of them. We'll start with Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, These people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So obedience is not something we can choose to do. It is something we are commanded to do. And we have to take care of our parents if we're at all able, uh, even as they become aged. Obedience is right, obedience is commanded, and obedience brings forth a twofold blessing, as we see in verses 2 and 3. He says that it may be w uh, well with you. And of course, he is primarily talking here about our spiritual well-being, and that you may live long upon the earth. Now, we know that's a general rule. Uh, the lack of discipline associated with the disobedient lifestyle makes life-threatening situations more common. And we see that with drunks and, and daredevils and uh, drug abusers. Because they've chosen a certain lifestyle, uh, they are more likely to come to a quick end. So... Children are to obey their parents for reasons. It's the Lord's will, it's right, it's commanded, and you return, get a return of a twofold blessing. Let's continue on to verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So let's talk about four responsibilities of Christian fathers. Children must be trained. If children are left to themselves, they will rebel. We know that even when they're not left to themselves, they often rebel. But if they are left to themselves, they will rebel. Go back and read in uh, Samuel, in the Old Testament, the story of Eli um, and his failure to train his sons properly and all the trouble that came from that. The first thing we read in this verse is he must not provoke his children. The authority of the father under Roman law was supreme, including the power of life and death for as long as the father lived. In Colossians 3.21 Paul said, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. So we suggest here on our chart six ways to avoid provoking our children. First, do not say one thing and then do another. That old saw, do as I say, not as I do, is worthless. As a matter of fact, it's worse than worthless because they're going to do as you do. You must not provoke them by blaming, 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 blaming for everything and never, ever praising. So do not blame and never praise. Do not discipline inconsistently. 
Do not make threats of discipline that you are not willing to carry out. Do not show favoritism one child to another. Do not make promises that you can't keep. And do not make light of problems that they, from their child's perspective, see as important. So, the, the father must not provoke the children. He must nurture the children. How? In the discipline and admonition of the Lord. Physical nourishment is not enough. A child must also be brought up emotionally and spiritually. The Bible does not leave this training to agencies outside of the home. It must be begun and checked on and continued from within the home under the leadership of a Christian parent. The Christian father also must discipline his children. Chastening is part of nurturing, but it must be done in love and not anger. It must be a fair chastening and it must be a consistent chastening. Furthermore, he must instruct and encourage these children. That's what admonition means. We counsel our children how Christians counsel their children with God's Word. Home is the place where a child must first learn about God and His will. Dropping the kids off at Sunday school just won't get this job done. It must come from within the family, within the parents. Having God's instructions, then, is a responsibility, but it's also a relief for fathers. Every father knows they need to teach their sons and daughters, but figuring out what to teach them without a plan is impossible. God makes this easy. We must teach our children God's commands, God's rules, God's principles, and God's virtues. We continue our reading in verses 5 through 8, and we will want to see three reasons that servants, and in our day and age here in our country, we might as well say employees, uh, should be obedient. So verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Paul here is referring to slaves. There's no doubt about it. But the application could be made to those in the employee-employer relationship as well. They are really serving Christ. That's who we serve. So no matter who our boss is, who our, we'll just say our master is, our master is Christ. And when we serve in our work, when we serve in our neighborhood, we are serving Christ. Because he is our true master in heaven. If both the servant and the master, if both the employer and the employer are Christians, then their working relationship needs to be grounded in the faith. The Christian worker will give a day's work for a day's pay and be hard at work whether the boss is looking at or not. That's how they honor their, bo their boss. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 1, he told the young preacher Timothy, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Doing a good job is God's will. It is man that has divided the spiritual and the secular. Any good work we do as Christians shines a light to the world. This light will shine even brighter if the world sees us hard at work at a task we do not care to perform. The third reason we will be rewarded by the Lord, whether we're slave or free. Regardless of how they are treated by the, the master, these good workers will be rewarded in the end time by the Lord. And these verses teach us to serve with humility, sincerity, honesty, 
cheerfulness, and I will add trust to that list as well. The final verse we want to look at today is verse 9, and we want to see four responsibilities of masters. I always like in these passages by Paul that when he says, children obey your parents, he turns around and tells the parent, the father, don't provoke your children to wrath. And when he tells bond servants how to act, he turns around, or employees how to act, he turns right around and tells the master or employer how he must act in the Lord. He says, masters do the same to them. In other words, treating them as they need to be treated, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there will be what? No partiality with him. So four responsibilities of masters toward their servants. Christianity is not designed to erase social or cultural distinctions. Many people have tried to use it that way and have failed miserably. Christ did not try to use it that way uh, when he walked on this earth. The apostles did not try to use it that way. They taught Christians how to work and be Christians within whatever way they found themselves. Servants are still servants, and employees are empl uh, employees are employees under the system of Christianity, and the Christian employer is still the boss. If you are a Christian employer, you must seek the servant's welfare. You must do the same thing. He must serve the Lord and watch out for his employees. Boaz is a great biblical example of a master who treated his servants according to God's will. If you have time, you might want to stop and read the short book of Ruth in your Old Testament. I'm going to quote only from Ruth 2 and verse 4. And behold, Boaz, the boss, came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, that is the servants, The Lord be with you, and they answered, The Lord bless you. This is how the boss and worker relationship should be carried out. He's looking out for the welfare of his workers. Secondly, he must motivate without threatening. The Roman masters had the power of life and death over their servants. Paul commands them not to use these threats as motivation. The Christian master must submit to the Lord. In the like manner of the church to Christ, wives to husband, children to parents, and employees to employers, the employers must submit to Christ. And if we want a model for that, our model is, of course, Jesus as the model servant ruler. In Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And of course, this is in the middle of a parable told by Christ. And then in chapter 20 and verse 27, he told his listeners, this is Jesus speaking, And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. So no one modeled this servant uh, master uh, better than Jesus Christ himself. He cannot play favorites. God is no respecter of persons, and he also expects his people to not use social station as a decider in how well he treats others. In 1 Timothy 5.21, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules, how? Without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. What if the master and servant are both Christians. We've already discussed that, but I want to th say two more things, especially this important. These things that we're studying are important if the master and the servant, if the employer and the employee are both Christians, that they use their relationship in Christ to make their working relationship even better rather than to abuse it and cause a stumbling block for one another. We know from the book of Philemon that uh, the slave of Philemon had run away and had come to Paul 
Paul understood what had happened, and in the book of Philemon, he is sending the slave back to Philemon. But he tells Philemon this. He says, Formerly this slave was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. And then, this makes us understand that Christian masters need to go the extra mile beyond what other masters would do. He continues in Philemon 121, Confident of your obedience, he writes to Philemon, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say in restoring uh, the slave back into the household. Well, this has been a short lesson today. Let's make a few concluding remarks and then we'll be done. First of all, let's talk about harmony in our life relationships. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from being filled with the Spirit. And we can only be filled with the Spirit when we turn to God's Word and let that Word fill us with the Spirit. It's nothing magical. It's nothing that just comes to you out of the clear blue sky. It comes to you out of the written word of God. Enjoying harmony in our life relationship comes from being joyful, thankful, and submissive. Enjoying harmony in our life relationships will make it easier to work closely with our Christian brothers and sisters. And finally, Having harmony in our life relationships will make it easier to bear witness to unbelievers. I hope you can join me next time when we will finish our discussion of Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through the end of the chapter, and that will conclude our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Thank you for watching. If you would subscribe to this channel, it would be a huge help to the channel. It would, it would cause the YouTube algorithm to suggest these videos to other people who have been searching for spiritual topics, especially if they're searching for, say, letters of Paul or Paul the Apostle, etc. So that's how you help, by subscribing, by liking uh, this video, and by making a comment. So, until we meet once again in our next video, may God bless.